Hello, this is the next video in my playlist that I'm calling Generalized Linear Models. Here we're going to look at logistic regression or logit regression. And it's part one because in part two we're going to illustrate this in R. And specifically what we're going to look at in R is the iteratively reweighted least squares procedure from scratch and then compare the result with the built-in function in R, GLM. But this video is the theory behind why iteratively reweighted least squares works. So I have some background videos, of course my playlist and generalized linear models, derivatives of inverse trig functions where there I drive the derivative of an inverse function, weighted least squares regression, exponential family, the Bernoulli, since we're in the binomial regression setting, uh, the mean and the variance of a logistic distribution. Now very quickly, the logistic distribution, we're, in this video, we're going to assume it has a mean of zero and some uh, standard deviation. Well, specifically, um, well, some standard deviation, but in, in uh, ultimately we want it to be a standard deviation of pi over the square root of three, or a variance of pi squared over three. And then because with this standard deviation, then the form of the density is very nice. And then in, in BV11, we drive the mean, the variance, and show that it is a PDF. We do not drive the, the CDF function of it, but that can be done on your own. And my one comment is that the logistic distribution is very normal-like, especially in this setting. So it's symmetric about zero. The hump's a little shorter, which means the tails are a little fatter. So there's a little more uncertainty in the tails. Now the general development for logistic regression is we assume y is a continuous random variable. And I know you're saying, well, wait, logistic regression deals with binary variables. And, and you're correct. But also remember that logistic regression is about two centuries old, 190 years or so. And it developed with a continuous random variable. And then they transform it to a binomial random variable. And this is what they did. And of course, 50 years ago, they the GLM models were invented and this fits into that paradigm so we can use that machinery to solve it but when it was first developed they, of course they didn't they weren't able to do that so then let's let X be some covariates that may influence Y and we're going to assume Y is a linear combination of our covariates plus some error and we're going to assume the error is the logistic um, model logistic distribution with mean zero and some standard deviation or some variance, however you want to think about it. Then we dichotomize y, and we're going to let it be y star. And it's a 1 if y is less than c, and 0 if y is less or greater than c. Now if we look at the mean of y star, a dichotomized variable, we're going to call that pi, or you could call it mu i. So it's the expected value of y star which is the probability that y star is 1, which is equal to the probability that y is less than c. But y was this linear combination, so we plug it in and take the basis to the other side. Now, this epsilon is a logistic random variable, or random variable distributed with the logistic distribution. So what we do is we divide by the standard deviation, Right, that's what this piece does. But we also multiply it by pi over square root of three. So then this random variable fits into these cases. And then these are nice to deal with. But if you do it to one thing, you have to do it to everything. And so we do. So here, the beta zero, we put with the beta or the C and then we multiply. And then everything else, it's minus x, and then that constant beta 1 all the way to beta k. Now, we can take this negative into this coefficient and, and put a plus there, and then relabel that as beta 1 star. We could, This can be beta 0 star, beta k, and, that, and that's where we get this. But the probability that this logistic random variable was less than some constant. That's the CDF. So it's the CDF of the logistic distribution evaluated at this linear combination of our coefficients. Now, 
and and that's done so that is the probability of, of one now we can since that's a CDF continuous CDF we can take the inverse of it and solve for this linear combination by itself so that's what we do here right and PI was the the mean the expected value and we're done and that's called a logit transformation now of course they they used to call it a logistic you know regression transformation but then when probit was invented or discovered in I think the 30s they called it probit which stood for probability unit and then when logistic regression became more popular someone coined the term logit to kind of mimic probe it and so that's where it became the term uh, logic transformation now then we find the density of y star remember it's a binomial so when when the probability that it's a one we said was this right and if it's a one that goes away probability that it's a zero is is this you know one minus p and this is it that's the density for a value of this dichotomized random variable. Note it's not in exponential form. We could transform it to that and then put it in canonical form with it, which would make the GLM model much easier. But we could also, this it, while it's a density, we could think about it as a likelihood if we switch the Y and the thought of how Y and beta reverse each other. It always, I never get text messages until I do videos. <laughs> um, and then we sum overall possibility, take the log and sum, and so this is the joint log likelihood. Um, and then, you know, since we take the log, that can come out front, same way, and we sum. And now we maximize this to find the estimates of beta that maximize it. But we're going to stop there and just jump right into the GLM structure. And I have a video called you know generalized linear models uh, general link function that and we're going to try to follow that exactly just to show you that that video is indeed is what used is used in R and other software packages so here's the density of a Bernoulli random variable in canonical form and see BV10 for that then this is the likelihood of this if this is the density then we switch those around and it becomes a likelihood but it's essentially the same thing we sum over our sample in and we get this uh, you know since we take the log that goes away but we're still summing the exponents you can see BV1 for that now this piece right here is called a log partition and there's some nice properties about the log partition that in BV2 I think are worthwhile to look at now, this is what we maximize. We want to maximize it in terms of the betas. But notice there's no betas here. So we're going to have, when we take the partial derivatives, we're going to have to use the chain rule several times to, to do this. So let's take, start taking partial derivatives that we need to maximize this. First of all, it's in terms of theta. So let's take the partial of Li. We're going to do a term, then we'll sum it later. So um, the partial of Li with respect to theta i, so we get yi, and then the derivative of this respect to theta i was the mean. And you can see BV1 for that. It's the derivative of the log partition ends up being the mean. So which also, so we can think of that as um, f of, you know, this linear combination of our covariates, right, from page one. Now, if we... Um, transform it. Remember that the logit transformation transforms the mean to get our linear combination. We generically call it eta. So when we take the derivative of eta with respect to beta, we find the jth beta and then take the derivative and that's the coefficient in front of it. pi is the mean, which we called mu i, which is the first derivative of our log partition. The variance of i, y i, is p p times q or p times one minus p which those are the means and since this is a function of the mean that's what we call the variance function and it's actually the second derivative of the log partition so this is all background from uh, bv1 now to find the derivative of 
theta with respect to mu i. Notice that theta is not by itself, but in BV2 we showed this is an increase, strictly increasing function, so we could take the inverse and get theta i by itself as a function of mu i. But since they're inverse functions, there's a nice property that says we can just take the reciprocal and take this derivative. And this derivative, is, it's already in the correct form. So the derivative of mu i with respect to theta i would be the second derivative, which is the variance function, which is mu times 1 minus mu, which on page 1 was the f of this linear combination, 1 minus f of that linear combination. Then the inverse function of our mean is this eta, that's a linear combination, that's the logit transformation. Now we can take capital F to both sides to get this, and then the derivative of mu i with respect to eta is just the density evaluated at eta, right? Capital, the derivative of capital F is little f. So then the derivative of mu i with respect to eta i is this. It's the density evaluated at our linear combination. Now we put all the pieces together to come up with our derivative. And this is ultimately what we wanted. And this first one was an easy choice because it was in, the likelihood was in terms of theta. And the eta is in terms of beta, so that's an easy one. Then we had to pick these so that they cancel leaving this. And then when you put all the pieces together, that's this piece. I think that was the bottom, that was the density, and that was x. And we set it to zero and solve. And we're going to do that through iteratively reweighted least squares. So in step one, beta, we set beta to zero. And then in step two, we let eta be this linear combination. But since those are all zeros, that's zero. And then to find the mean, we take f of eta, but that's a CDF evaluated at its center point, so that's 5.5, and then we plug it into these. Now, on BV4 uh, or 5, I don't remember, the general uh, link function, this was the formula. But the derivative of our link function was 1 over the density, and so you plug in this for that and you get this value. Remember, that's our linear combination, that's our data, that's our mean, and that's the density evaluated in it. Now the weight, wi, is 1 over the square of the derivative of our link function times the variance. And here, usually there's a weight function in here, a dispersion parameter, but for binomial it's not there, so it's, all, it's just 1. And this derivative was 1 over the density, so that becomes density squared. And then that's our uh, variance function, mu i 1 minus mu i, where mu i is this. Now, at step 3, we estimate beta. We came up with estimates for w and z, and then we maximize it. And then we put those estimates back in here, maximize, and we keep repeating two, steps 2 and 3 until we get convergence. And that's done. We're, that's iteratively reweighted least squares regression. Now, we're going to take these steps exactly and plug them into R and let it run at 20 iterations. And then we're going to compare it with the built-in function for R, the GLM function for binomial regression using the logit link, and compare them. And they are 100% the same. And to me, that's just so fascinating. To, to see and understand what's going behind the scenes, going on behind the scenes. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. I sure did. Please like the video so you don't miss the next one, or subscribe so you don't miss the next one, and I will see you later. Thanks. Bye.